Hi, 4303. So today I want to text you, teach you the next reading skill for reading workshop, which is something you already do very well, but I'm also going to read the chapter eight for the social studies readings. Okay. So something that you guys already do really well as readers is envision. You picture yourselves in the scene. Now we're just going to apply that work to nonfiction. So today I want to teach you that the important thing about reading history is that it requires both imagination and factual knowledge. Readers need to use their factual knowledge to help them do the imaginative work of envisioning and putting themselves in the historical scene. So today, you're gonna to see me use the facts that I know about the social studies topic to picture myself right in the scene as I'm reading it, okay? So I'm gonna start with chapter eight, which is called Parliament Stumbles Again. Who was in charge? You might think Parliament would get the message. No taxation without representation. The colonists had drawn the line there, but the British government still needed money and it needed to show who was boss. And so in 1767, just one year after repealing the Stamp Act, Parliament tried again, this time as part of the Townsend Acts. It placed taxes on glad, glass, paint, lead paper, and a number of other goods that the colonists imported. It says the British government tax imported goods that the colonists needed. So I'm going to start and I'm on page 52. This was Parliament's thinking. The colonists needed those goods, okay? So I know Parliament is the government back in England, okay? And they're thinking, well, these people over here need these goods. So when we send our ships over there and they deliver them to the colonial harbors, our officials will be there to collect the tax. Now, I know that England has already sent over lots of soldiers in uniforms, they have their guns, and they march really nicely in line. So I'm picturing when the ships deliver them, and the people get off the boats, those people, the officials there in the uniforms are gonna be the ones to collect the tax. Hmm. Parliament made things worse by saying whomever was arrested for not paying tax would be tried without a jury. So now thinking, what does that mean again? Trial without a jury. Okay, so I've been arrested for doing something wrong, I'm a colonist, and now I'm in the courtroom, I'm having a trial, but I don't have that jury. I don't have that group of people over there who's gonna say, hmm, I did the crime or no, I didn't do the crime. Okay, that group isn't gonna decide for me. It's gonna be one person who's in charge of the whole decision. Yikes, that would be really scary. Hmm. Taxation without representation again. And this time, trial without a jury, so much for the rights of Englishmen, once again, the Sons of Liberty swung into action. So I'm picturing that group of colonial men gathering together and thinking we must do something about this because they're taking away our rights again. They organized another boycott of all the British goods. Well, I know they had a boycott before and they refused to buy the goods. So I'm picturing people by the harbor when all the goods are off the ships and it's pretty empty because everyone's refusing to buy them. So all those merchants are sitting around waiting to sell their glass and lead and paint. And no one's coming there. They have no customers. Hmm. The quality of the homemade items was also not as good as those purchased from Britain. It may have cost more to make them, but the colonists would do what they have to do to get their point across. The boycott lasted for nearly three years. Again, picture those merchants, people trying to sell things by the water. Three years, they had no customers, or very few. Once again, the colonists succeeded. They were happy, oh, I'm picturing them celebrating. British merchants and manufacturers lost so much money because of the boycott that they demanded Parliament repeal the new taxes. So that's the people and the merchants who are waiting over here on the boats, waiting, hoping the colonists are gonna buy the goods. They were mad that their own government had taxed these people who were supposed to be their customers. So the merchants went back and said, you have to take this tax, get rid of it, because these colonists are refusing to buy our goods. So not only are the colonists mad at England, so are the merchants who are trying to sell goods to the colonists. It was one thing for the colonists to demand that Parliament repeal a tax. Parliament could ignore them if they wish, picturing the king and the group of people ignoring, sitting on their throne. Hmm. But Parliament, Parliament could hardly ignore the powerful businessmen of their own country. 
So they could ignore some people, but they can't ignore the people who are placing demands on them and saying, we elected you to vote. You're supposed to place these rules in our honor. So in 1770, Parliament repealed all but one of the taxes. So they had lots of little taxes coming up over here. They took them all back except for one. The British government kept the tax on tea as a symbol of their right to pass laws and tax the colonies. So the only reason they kept that tax is just to show them, you know, we can make rules for you and we can tax you if you want. And so they're just trying to keep that one rule to show them that they're still boss. The colonists responded accordingly. They ended their boycott of all goods from Britain, except for one. Can you guess which item they continue to boycott? Well, the only item that's still taxed, that has to be tea, right? Parliament, so again, I'm picturing now that not just any merchants in the harbor, I'm picturing the people selling the tea in the harbor and they have no customers. Parliament had left the tax on tea to show that it had the right to tax the colonists. The colonists continued to boycott the on tea to show that Parliament did not have the right to tax them. Each side was willing to leave it at that for the time being. The colonists, who were big tea drinkers, didn't give up tea completely. They simply brought, bought their tea from Dutch merchants who smuggled it into the colonies. Okay, so these colonists here who really want their tea aren't buying it from the British merchants. But now they're buying it from other merchants in the harbor that are coming over from other places, sort of near England. And those merchants bringing it over have to smuggle it in and they're not allowed to bring it there. So they're bringing it in illegally. So they're being very sneaky about buying the tea who they're buying it from because they're not supposed to. Now I'm on page 53 where it says subheading the Boston Massacre. Okay. So I'm imagining, what do I know so far again about the people? This is in Boston. That's one of the major cities in the New England colonies. So that's going to be by the water. It's going to be sort of in the northern area. It's in the north, so there might not be as many enslaved people there. Okay. So Boston and a massacre. I know that's when people die. So I'm already picturing a scene maybe by a harbor, by the water, and some people are dying. Okay. Meanwhile, more Brit British troops arrived in the colonies. The colonists grew alarmed. For them, the presence of British soldiers represented a threat to their freedom. The British said the soldiers were needed to defend the colonists against Native American attacks. If that were true, why weren't the soldiers on the frontier where the Native Americans were? So they're saying, you know, more British troops arrived in the colonies. Can you imagine even more soldiers on the land? And it says the soldiers were there to protect the Native Americans. But the colonists were saying if they're to protect the Native Americans, why aren't they over near where Native Americans are living? Over inland, okay, away from the colonists. The Native Americans and the colonists didn't really live near each other. So the soldiers should have been near the Native Americans. So I'm wondering if the soldiers were really there for the Native Americans or they were there for the colonists. Why were so many troops located in eastern cities like Philadelphia, New York, and Boston? In Boston in particular, troops seemed to be everywhere, on the street corners, in front of buildings, in the parks, nowhere near where the Native Americans are. The citizens, the colonists of Boston, jeered at the soldiers. Ooh, they're like poking at them, making fun of them, probably like sticking their tongue out because they don't like them, right? They made fun of them. They tried to make their lives miserable. Because British soldiers sometimes had regular jobs, tensions grew over employment opportunities too. In several cities, fights broke out between colonists and soldiers. So we see the soldiers and the colonists fighting for the same job. Those fights were not nearly as bad as what happened in Boston on the evening of March 5th, 1770. Okay, so it's the evening time. There's a crowd of men and boys gathered around a lone British soldier. Okay, so I'm picturing a British soldier, probably in a red coat, okay? And this British soldier is so now being surrounded by boys and a crowd of men, and he's by himself. Now they're starting to shout at him. He's being surrounded. They're throwing snowballs at this soldier. He's probably getting pretty scared. Some snowballs had rocks inside of them. Ow, that must be hurting. 
The frightened soldier called for help. More British soldiers arrive. So now I'm picturing soldiers coming around on the group that's closing in on this one guy. The crowd grew larger. Well, maybe more colonists are coming outside. The shouts, the dares, and the insults grew louder and angrier. Then, for reasons that are unclear, the soldiers turned their guns and on the angry crowd. So hold on, the soldiers must be running towards this, their one soldier who's being surrounded, and then they turn around at the crowd with their guns and shot. When the smoke cleared, five colonists lay dead or wounded. Are you picturing that? There was all this big commotion. They were trying to surround this one soldier. Everyone's running towards it. Shots are fired. And then smoke clears. And then there's five people dead on the ground. It goes from probably really loud and crazy and hectic to really somber and quiet because people were just shot. The blood, their blood stained the snow-covered street. That's right, there was snowball, so it's really cold out. And there's people on the ground. One of them was Crispus Attucks, who had been enslaved and now worked as a sailor. Crispus Attucks was the first African-American to die for the cause of American liberty. He was not the last. So I'm picturing an African-American African -American man who was dead from the massacre, laying on the ground, maybe on the snow-covered streets, a few days later, more than half of the population of Boston turned out for a funeral march for the dead men. Oh, I'm picturing a slow, sad funeral march. Church bells rang. Angry Bostonians called the killing a massacre and needless killing of defenseless people. The event became known as the Boston Massacre. A Boston silversmith, picturing a man who's hammering silver. He's working with actual silver. Right? He named Paul Revere, made a copper engraving, something that you grave into or like um, engrave, sort of carve, that showed soldiers firing on a group of perfectly peaceful, innocent citizens. Now, wait a minute. This picture that he's um, engraving is showing soldiers firing on quiet citizens. That's not true because what happened was actually the citizens were teasing the soldier, right? They were throwing things at him, they were making faces. So this picture that Paul Revere made isn't really representing what really happened in the massacre. It's important to remember. And now many paper copies can be printed from a single engraving. That's exactly what Revere did. So now he made this engraving of the truth of something that didn't really happen. And now he's making copies of it to be sent around. Uh-oh, I think news is gonna be spread about something that didn't actually reveal the full truth about the massacre. No one knows for sure whether Revere actually saw the shooting. Some of the things shown in the engraving are not true, like we said. But Paul Revere was a son of liberty. He made that engraving because he wanted to make people angry at the British. Well, that's one way to do it and make up lies. That'll make people mad. Sure, the citizens who were shot had been asking for trouble, but they certainly did not deserve to die. What do you think? The British soldiers who fired on the crowd were tried by a local court. Well, so now I'm picturing these soldiers and their red coats inside of a courtroom. It found that six, six soldiers innocent and two guilty of manslaughter. So six of them were innocent, they were free, and then two of them were found guilty. So I'm seeing probably six probably pretty happy soldiers, two not so happy soldiers. The lawyer who defended them picturing that lawyer in the courtroom arguing on behalf of the soldiers was John Adams, okay? So when you read the social studies chapters, don't forget to use the facts you know about the topic. Also to picture yourself in the scene, try to really see what's happening in this time. 